Uh, lots of different homestead applications. We're gonna, uh, here's a few of my favorites. Um, the really easy one is just scattered in your poultry housing. On the floor, the char left over, if you don't screen the char out, it's gonna help absorb any ammonia gases that are created. When urine, if you, were, if you take your wood ashes and you pee on them, you're gonna release a lot of ammonia gas. The wood ashes are there to kind of help, help neutralize acidic conditions, but, um, but the char is there to go ahead and absorb it. So if you don't feel like fiddling with your stuff at all, Poultry housing is a great application for it. You can also screen the ash out, use a little sifting mechanism. It's really good for dusting uh, feathers, um, taking care of mites and stuff. Ice melt is another great one. The potassium and calcium carbonate salts are, um, I said likely, but we're pretty sure they're more environmentally safe than the uh, conventional chloride salts that are being used on roads now. Uh, much safer for waterways. We're going to pay attention to some garden applications, cooking. I'm probably going to breeze past food preservation because I didn't get very far with that. Um, and then hopefully get into some soap making before we end tonight. All right, cooking, cooking. One thing you can do with ash without a whole lot of effort is um, this process, and I'm going to butcher this word, uh, nishtamalization, nishtamal. It's a traditional Central American method of modifying field corn to make the nutrients more accessible, bioavailable, right? Specifically vitamin B3. It's making niacin, it becomes a lot more available. And this gets really important when say, you know, field corn is your primary grain. Um, there's some, some really horrifying images of people with niacin deficiencies. And uh, this process is pretty important for them. Also, um, equally as important, a, a new word that seems to be getting a lot of traction is uh, aflatoxins. You guys familiar with that? These are, um, Pat, do you want to explain that? It's the major carcinogen in Africa. Yeah. Um, it's a mold, you know, and it can get on any grains, um, and it's a big deal. They're trying to breed plants to be more resistant. They're trying all kinds of things, but it yeah. basically, and we're set up for it in this climate. I mean, you know. You yeah, know, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful environment for aflatoxins, but fortunately we can pro we're better at getting our stuff dried and harvested and stored in a way that we don't get them as much. There you go. But on the homestead, it may be a bigger deal, so this is very important for that. Yeah, so what's, what's neat here is if you get into uh, reading some of the research online, the traditional methods of nichtimalization, um, which is basically involves using um, uh, calcium, um, calcium oxide and, um, or slake lime. So you get, calcium oxide would be called quick lime or slake lime, which is like a calcium hydroxide. Using those and boiling your corn for just a minute, basically getting it up to boil, mixing in some calcium oxide, and then uh, it's a long soak period that may be 12 to 24 hours. And that traditional method compared to industrial methods of nitrogenization has been shown to um, uh, be much more effective at uh, eliminating aflatoxins. Some are up to like 90%. Um, so one thing that we can do with wood ashes is use that as a stand-in for traditional lime. And we, we can use the, uh, the calcium carbonates that are in the wood ashes, and we can use the um, potassium carbonates, the potash that's in wood ash, to um, uh, do this nitrogenization, which is going to modify proteins and uh, well, who's heard of masa, masa harina? That's nishtamalized corn. Um, smells great. It's like, makes the whole house smell so wonderful. Really, it, it does help to, to make the flavor more rich and um, you can remove the seed cap um, somewhat easily and definitely makes it easier to grind. And uh, I went ahead and made some cornbread that, um, I would like to share with you guys out of uh, yeah, nishtamalized corn. You guys are in luck, it is good stuff. And I, I don't have a knife or anything to serve that. Does somebody want to serve that up? And I'm going to keep going. This is just a diversion. We're about to get into the hard chemistry stuff here. <laughs> um, you know, traditional methods, um, nishtamal with lime. Okay, I was wrong about oxide. We're using calcium hydroxide, which is uh, pickling lime. You can go buy it in the store tonight, if you're really eager to get started. <laughs>
I'm going to refer to a, a video, a, a great little short, condensed, real quick video. The guy's talking rapid fire. And he, he shows the whole process, just taking your corn kernels and using lime. It's on a channel called Flavor Lab. The guy does little food science stuff. I love it to death. Basically, it's, it's what I already said. You're going to mix the, um, the corn kernels. Is it good? <laughs> you're going to mix the corn kernels in with slaked lime, and then uh, you're going to bring it to a boil and then just let it sit for about 12 hours. And then you've got to rinse it like crazy. You're going to get a soapy feel. That's how you know that it's alkaline enough to make a difference. Um, notice this picture up in the right, top right corner. Notice the color change? Okay, that's, uh, that's what you're going to, you're going to notice that color change usually within about five minutes after adding your lime to your corn. That's kind of the uh, rough and ready way to know if your uh, alkali is strong enough. Is that similar to the, what happens when you make hominy? It is hominy. Oh, yeah. This is hominy, okay. yeah. With wood ashes, I had to do a little bit of experiment in here. Um, you know, the, the science is hard on this because everybody's wood ashes are different. You remember I showed you the two different samples of wood ashes? Huge difference here um, when you're applying it to food. Uh, it can be, a, it was a little challenging for me at, at first. Um, I had very good, well, I'd say that opposite. I, I had very good success the first time I did this using two parts corn to one part old sifted ash. These are my ashes from last year, right? And I sifted them, I removed as much charcoal as I could out of them through a very fine screen. I added uh, my corn to the pot, I got it warmed up, added water just enough to cover the uh, corn, and then I added my wood ash and stirred it up, and then I filled my pot up with water. It, it's, it's kind of an energy intensive process, certainly on a larger scale this would be very much a water intensive process. But uh, almost right away, within a few minutes, I had um, that pretty immediate color change. This is the Bloody Butcher uh, dent corn that uh, Rocco and the crew grew over at North Farm this year. Um, so it's very fresh and um, very good, very good. I did this again a few days ago and I used ashes directly out of my wood stove. Had a fire that night or that morning and I grabbed ashes that afternoon out of my wood stove. And I will tell you, I had to reduce the um, um, volume by quite a bit. This is talking about those fresh ashes versus the old ashes. Um, the fresh ashes were very strong. There's likely some hydroxides present um, because I got an immediate color change and something else happened. At, um, at one day ashes to three quarters of a cup, so I already reduced a little bit. Yeah, three quarters of a cup, um, fresh wood ashes to two cups of corn was very strong. And um, w what I noticed is the seed cap um, almost mushed within an hour. It, it had almost melted in there and had turned the whole brine just this thick, like syrupy kind of color. It was, uh, and the flavor was way off. And I, I had a little jar, I didn't get it in here, but um, really soapy flavor, right? So um, I, I modified that and I went down to um, those same ashes. I went all the way down to uh, a quarter cup to um, one cup. So um, eightfold decrease. And um, that's what you guys are eating right now. It's actually really delicious. Have you had any? Uh, no, not of that batch. No. I've had plenty of it lately though. Okay, let's, uh, while you guys are enjoying your, your Food. Let's talk a little bit about alkalinity. Does anybody remember this from their chemistry days? Cool. Ionic compounds are um, atoms that are bonded electrically. Okay? Water is an ionic compound. Um, salts are ionic compounds. Um, ionic compounds can break apart into positive cations and negative anions. Right? And um, these wood ashes contain a lot of these uh, soluble ionic salts. Um, salts of the alkali metals, which are on the left side of the periodic table, specifically sodium and uh, potassium are the ones we're interested in. 
Lithium, I learned this just a few days ago. Lithium salts are also um, alkaline salts that are used in um, lithium grease. And uh, magnesium and calcium salts are going to be present too. Um, those are the alkali earth metals. They're going to be a little less soluble. Still may be soluble, though not at all in the range that we're working in. So these salts, just like water, can, can break apart into these uh, cations and anions. Uh, when water ionizes, it breaks into a single hydrogen cation and a uh, negative hydroxide anion. Remember, I've been talking about hydroxides already, potassium and sodium hydroxide, the lyes. L-Y-E. If there's more hydrogen ions in a solution, that solution is acidic. If there's more hydroxide anions, that solution is basic. If it's basic because you added some alkali salts, it's alkaline. Potassium carbonate is probably the one salt that we're going to pay the most attention to tonight. It's, uh, does anybody know what it is? Common, common name for potassium carbonate, potash, so, um, which is actually, believe it or not, that's where um, potassium gets its name from the old, old timer potash. So they're taking their ashes, they're running water through it, and then they're boiling their ash in a pot, and they're using their potash. And they found that it's really rich in potassium, so it's a good potassium. Does potassium carbonate actually exist in the earth as that? I mean, because of why I ask is because my brother used to work at a mine in Saskatchewan. Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. actually have potash mine. Yeah, absolutely. So is it actually in the ground? Just pull it up. Yeah, well, so there's a, you know, geological processes where, um, you know, water comes in and evaporates off and the salts are left behind. Yeah. And, you know, over eons, there's, yeah, huge salt deposits. Maybe going out of my league, but I, I think that's why a lot of our soils are really alkaline out west. Um, so, potassium carbonate is our um, soluble salt that's present in wood ash. And um, it will ionize in water into two potassium um, cations and then this negative carbonate anion. And so, in acidic solutions, right, so like lemon juice or something, uh, a carbonate ion is going to react with those hydrogen ions that are floating around, and it's going to produce bicarbonates. Okay? Additional carbonate ions will steal hydrogen ions from water molecules forming hydroxides. So this is how we're getting this really alkaline basic solution. And um, the basicity of that solution is measured um, with pH, which is basically a, a way to measure the amount of hydrogen anions that are, or cations that are floating around in that water, okay? So um, this I, I thought was pretty interesting. Something I really, maybe I learned it in high school, but just forgot. A, a pure water, we know that that's pH neutral at seven, right? It has a hydrogen cation concentration of seven decimal points over, right? White vinegar, pretty acidic four decimal points over, so pH is four. Potassium carbonate potash is around 10, so it's 10 decimal points over. I thought that was kind of neat. Um, something else that, I probably, again, I probably learned in high school, but um, did not retain, because I wasn't interested in the time, is um, indicators, pH indicators. You guys, all, I mean, I'm sure you guys have all seen regular pH strips. Did you know that you can make a pH strip out of red cabbage? And this was just so fascinating to me. But um, it's just one of those ways that, um, that you can be uh, chemically independent on your homestead. You can grow your own pH indicator. Um, this is a paper that's been soaked in a, a boiled red cabbage. And I want to show you the difference between this old wood ash and this pure wood ash. On, on my red cabbage indicator. See how that's turning kind of a pretty bright green there? That means that that pH isn't even on this scale. It's closer to, closer to 13. 
that's some pretty uh, pretty strong stuff. So you like you took a strip of a coffee filter or something like that, or this is blotting paper. And you soaked it in boiled cabbage water. Right? Yeah, yeah. Let it dry. Yeah, there's plenty of recipes on how to do this. This is kind of like one of those go-to uh, like middle school science lessons because you know you get to play around with all this colored water. Um, it's kind of hard to see. One of those is definitely bluer than the other. Okay, um, I think it gets more yellow as it gets more uh, alkaline, and blue is definitely closer to uh, um, neutral. So again, the fresh stuff, you know, those fresh ashes are definitely putting off something quite a bit more alkaline. Kevin Dunn from, from that caveman chemistry book and, and scientific soap making has a, a pretty clever way of uh, phrasing everything. He, one thing he does is when he talks about soaking wood ashes, he, he talks about using it in a two liter bottle. Um, and uh, he calls it a 21st century gourd, which I love that. <laughs> and then he calls pH paper your uh, virtual tongue. But um, that's absolutely a way to test alkalinity. It's just to uh, touch it on the tip of your tongue, and you're looking for that kind of burning, tingling sensation, right? That's that very bitter taste. So um, uh, these extremely alkaline substances are going to um, probably a little dangerous to be doing that. Um, let's move on. One question, Dan. Uh, yeah. When you leach the water through the ashes, the potash is left in the ashes or it's in the water? We'll get, we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about that for a long time here. Okay. Let's get to the garden stuff, because I, I think that's probably what most of you guys are here for. Um, and uh, Pat, I may appeal to you a little bit here if we're getting into the, uh, sure. uh, okay. deep into the soil stuff. Uh -huh. um, there is a, a very long tradition of using wood ash in compost. Have you guys heard of the indoor? Indore composting method. Um, this is a, um, uh, uh, I would say a scientist, sure. Um, Albert Howard did a lot of work in India back in the uh, uh, early part of the century, um, developing composting systems um, that were very successful at the time. He, he was, I guess, considered the father of composting. Uh, wood ash was a, a very essential part to his system. Um, in terms of neutralizing acidity of the compost. Um, ash can be very useful for correcting overly acidic soils. And as we know, it's a valuable source of potassium and calcium. Uh, nearly everybody agrees if you're going to use wood ash anywhere to apply it very thinly and to test your soil often. Um, do not use wood ash if you've got soil that's already um, out of optimum range. If you've got alkaline soil, just forget about it. Nothing in wood ash is going to help you. Um, now, if you have a really acidic soil, wood ash can be very helpful. Um, uh, as I learned today from Pat, most of our soils around the area are already pretty rich in potassium, too. So there's a good chance that us in this room, um, wood ashes may not be a very helpful amendment for, for us. Um, uh, obviously, don't use it around acid-loving plants. You like stay away from your blueberries. Um, here's my hypothesis. Remember my brown ashes that are carbon-rich, um, rather impure in terms of alkalinity. Um, that would be a good choice for using in your garden or your compost. It's going to be more complex organic matter in there. Um, the uh, alkali matter is going to be quite a bit softer. Won't be as aggressive. Um, I want you to imagine, you know, these very alkaline ashes. What if you were to put that in your active compost bin that's just got all these beautiful worms just coming in and moving around? You think a worm with its, like, moist skin is going to want to rub up against a pile of ashes? Forget about it. That would, like, that would burn them. Um, so, so I think we need to be very careful about how we apply wood ashes. Um, Definitely get that soil test done. In North Carolina, you can do it for free. Um, a, a simple, very basic soil test from NCDA um, will confirm your soil pH and give you some basic readouts on nutrients. Again, my theory is that if you're going to put ashes outside in the compost, they should be uh, kept in, in actual open containers. 
What, what happens when you leave ashes out in the open is, um, yeah, Pat. A quick point, you can do it for free half the year, half the year they charge you. That's right, because yeah. Everybody does it in the fall till mm -hmm. early spring, and so they charge you for that time. So do it in the summer and it's free. Yeah, it's still pretty cheap. It's yeah, it's cheap enough. Five, five dollars or something, anytime. Too. Hmm? The postage is expensive. That's a good point. That's the price of shipping it. Yeah. So what are those pictures there? <laughs> Can't read it. Uh, that's a, uh, a photo out of um, Albert Howard's book that he wrote in 1931 on, uh, on composting called The Waste Products of Agriculture. It's a kind of a manual on, on composting, and I believe one of the, maybe, maybe the first manual of composting. Uh, he made some pretty uh, bold claims. There's no doubt it was really good compost. He made some claims about there being more nitrogen in the compost than if you add up all the ingredients, the nitrogen in all the ingredients that went in. But uh, no doubt, it's really, really good compost. Pulled a lot of people out of uh, destitution in, I think it was northern India somewhere um, in those days. It was pretty powerful stuff. Um, something about the uh, uh, fresh ashes. Remember, they're, they're going to be burned real hot. You're going to have more of those oxides, hydroxides in it. Those actually convert to carbonates over time. Um, pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. And uh, just by doing that, the, the alkalinity is going to be reduced, and they're going to be a little bit softer, right? So I think if you're going to use it in your garden, uh, just by my test with nationalization of corn, I, I, I'm intuitively I'm going to think that the older ashes that are more carbonate rich are going to be the better ashes for garden applications, right? They're going to be the ones that are least likely to burn. Um, so if you want to go after using wood ashes, do that. And do not do it unless you know your pH. Uh, kind of the traditional method of, of making your soil more alkaline is adding lime. Everybody's heard of add lime to your soil. Um, it's really easy to overdo, and it's really hard to correct if you overdo, OK? Um, most of these uh, uh, ag agents, I thought I'd put it on here, um, read this over and over and over again. It's uh, five pounds per um, 100 square feet, no more than that at a time. You can read a lot about lime and soils. There, there's plenty of information online about that. Smaller doses recommended. Um, so wood ashes are going to be different from your uh, regular agricultural lime because they're going to contain all these micronutrients. And um, there's going to be a lot of potassium and some phosphorus. Uh, just forget nitrogen. There's almost nothing in there. Um, and uh, one other thing, too, is don't apply, um, don't apply lime or um, wood ashes at the same time. It's like another uh, really nitrogen-rich fertilizer because it can volatilize as um, ammonia gases, you'll lose a lot of your nitrogen that way. So my plan is to use wood ashes at my house on my little front lawn area where my kids play soccer and um, where NCDA is recommending that I apply lime to that area. And I'm only going to use ashes that I've already leached the potassium out of because I know that um, I don't need to add any more potassium to my soil. Okay. Um, and I'm going to apply along with some soft rock phosphate that I have um, left over from a bulk purchase I made a long time ago. Yes? The one exception for around here is probably hay fields because there's tons of potassium in the stems. Yeah. So people are taking hay off all the time, oftentimes need to replace potassium. Yeah. So that, and indeed, the yeah. Finch Gardens up by us put a call out two years ago for people to deliver ashes and they, want, they would ash the field or hay. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very good. I've got a question. Yeah. If, like, the composting bins that I have are open all the time, and uh, I'm one, and when I, I'm wondering if I throw ash that has uh, charcoal in it, is that detrimental? No, that's fine. That's fine. We talk a lot about, you know, we call that charcoal. We call that biochar here, and we talk about biochar all the time, and it's a, um, it, it's generally pretty good stuff for your compost, especially in the quantities that you're going to be putting it in through the ash.
possibly better to sift out the ash and just put your charcoal in it. Um, could be better. I would be more concerned about the ash going in than the charcoal. The charcoal does a lot of interesting things in compost, but um, mostly it helps from the compost getting too dense. And then it'll uh, kind of temper the moisture content of the pile too, help it go from being too dry or too wet, so it's going to shed water when you need it. And um, uh, it's also going to trap those ammonia gases that are created. So you're going to retain more nitrogen in your pile. Um, I, we could talk all night about biochar, <laughs> but but we've got to keep going. 